This episode is brought to you by Our Daily Bread Ministries, a global media organization that makes the life-changing wisdom of the Bible understandable and accessible to all. Visit whereyou'refrom.org for more information. That's where, Y-A, from, dot O-R-G. This episode is part of a long series exploring the rise of Christian fundamentalism. It can stand on its own, but when you're done, go back and start at the beginning of Season 5. Our story starts in Boston. It's April 1855. The city maybe had about 160,000 people in it. A young man working in a shoe store attends a small Bible study in a church. This man is not well educated, only went through about fourth grade. But a bunch of guys in the group went to Harvard. Can you imagine how intimidating that must have been? But he does it. He goes in, sits down with these educated men, and tries to hold his own. One Sunday when his teacher, Edward Kimball, asked him to turn to the Gospel of John, he started looking in Genesis. For those uninitiated, John is about three quarters of the way through the Bible. Genesis is at the very beginning. It's a rookie mistake flipping to the beginning, In other contexts, this might not have seemed like a big deal. But in a room with a bunch of Harvard men, you can imagine it was a bit stressful. Dwight Moody's life was shaped by what happened next. Of course, the Harvard students began to laugh down their sleeves at him a bit. And Kimball did something that was very striking that Moody never forgot. He took his own Bible, which was open to the passage there in the Gospel of John, and gave it to Moody and took Moody's Bible in his own hands. This seemingly small act of kindness gave Kimball credibility in the life of D.L. Moody, so that what happened later was all the more personal. Kimball felt like he had to tell Moody about Jesus. It's not always easy to just walk up to someone and tell them about your faith, but Kimball went for it. He saw Moody there, you know, shifting stock and decided to go back into the stockroom and tell him about Jesus Christ and the claims of Christ to uh, to want to redeem him and how much he loved Moody, how much he cared for Moody's soul. One person sharing their faith with another. That's how ministry has been done for literally thousands of years. A simple kindness, a relationship, and a testimony to the power of Jesus' sacrifice. This act has been repeated millions of times, millions. But this one was different. Because that man, that shoe salesman from a poor family with a fourth grade education, went on to change the course of American history. A conservative estimate has said that he spoke to as many as 100 million people over the course of his preaching ministry. This is Kevin Belmonte talking about the evangelist D.L. Moody. He's the author of the book, can you guess the title, D.L. Moody, A Life. Moody is one of those rare Christian characters that is unavoidable when writing a history of his times, even in writing secular histories, because he is everywhere. Of course, we know him as a preacher, uh, a preeminent preacher whose influence extended to people whose names we know well, closer to our own time like Billy Graham, for whom he was a real model. But I think you also have to look at him as a philanthropist. He raised huge sums of money. He founded four educational institutions, and part of those philanthropic funds went to help those schools get established and be on a sound financial footing. But many times he helped raise funds for other churches other than his own, which he founded there in Chicago, or church that he attended there in Northfield. He also helped support orphanages and hospitals. Moody did everything, establishing schools, colleges, a publishing house, hospitals, preaching, evangelizing in the United States and Britain. This season, we're exploring the rise of Christian fundamentalism in the United States, and you can't quite do that without talking about Moody. Which is funny, because by all accounts, Moody was not a fundamentalist. But... Some of his methods and several of his disciples launched that movement. We'll get to that in the next episode. Today, 
we're going to get to know this very important man, in part because he was so influential, but also because, let's be honest, I can only do so much critiquing on this show. It's also valuable to just see what went right in that era. If you need just one example, look no further than the hymn book published by Moody and his musician friend, Ira Sankey. Now, I know, a hymn book? Who cares? Well, this was the second half of the 1800s. There was no radio, no television. If you wanted to listen to music, you or somebody else around you had to play the music yourself, live. A best-selling hymn book was kind of a big deal. Well, they owned the copyright to what was one of the most lucrative publishing copyrights, the Moody Sankey hymn books. Moody had published that at his own expense, so he and Sankey had the copyright, but they refused to touch a penny of it. As a matter of fact, they created a three-person board of trustees, and they asked that those funds be dispersed to build buildings at the schools Moody had founded, to help churches like the ones he'd established in Chicago or other needy churches in major metropolitan centers, also hospitals and orphanages. While Moody was not a perfect guy, his legacy is undeniable and really inspiring. We often cover hard stuff on this show. Today, let's celebrate the legacy of a man who raised the bar on what a man of God could be. You're listening to the show that uses journalistic tools to look inside the Christian church. We press pause on the culture wars in order to explore how we got here and how we can do better. I'm Chris Starin, and this is Truce. Today, there is a college named after Moody, a radio network, and a Bible conference in his honor. But when you look to his origins, he couldn't have been raised in a home where there were more challenges stemming from poverty. He had a hard start. His father passed away when he was just four years old. A tragedy in any era. But remember, this was the 1840s. It was a lot harder back then for women to find good, well-paying jobs. Plus, Moody's mom had her hands full. At that point, there were seven children in the family. And right about that time, his mother, Betsy, found out she was pregnant with twins. So very soon, there were nine mouths to feed. Nine mouths and just one parent. And the creditors had come and taken everything except the house. Uh, they were able to keep the house and a few other things that they hid, such as his father's mason tools and the family cow. But everything else went, even the firewood. I mean, it was dire circumstances. That's right. The debt collectors took the family firewood. One of his uncles chipped in to help, but it was a big burden to share. They were able to keep the family together, but the kids were sent off to work on neighboring farms to earn money, leaving less time for school. Thankfully, there was a very kind Unitarian pastor there in the town, Oliver Everett, and uh, he rallied to the family's aid. He helped stock their pantry. Uh, he would uh, take the children in rides on the wagon to church to try and encourage them in things of the faith, but show them many other kindnesses. Which was his main source for spiritual influence as a child. Now, I know, one of the great evangelists of our time and a key part of the fundamentalist movement was influenced by a Unitarian. God does what he wants to do. Moody loved his mother. And growing up in Northfield, Massachusetts, meant a lot to him. It's a place he'd come back to as an adult. It's where he built some of his schools and where his famous conference, which will be important in the next episode, took place. Moody was a tough kid. If he were on my school bus, which I drive in between making this show, I would almost certainly have to sit him right up front just so I could keep an eye on him. He had a lot of rough edges. He, he would have been the first to tell you uh, he, he was known as someone who was not afraid to uh, to get into scrapes and scraps and, and, and put up his fists and fight if somebody crossed him. He talks about having done that when he moved to Boston, if somebody rubbed him the wrong way. He was not above cursing now and then if he lost his temper. I think one thing that's important to remember, he knew enough to know that he needed to get out of Northfield and, and take the long train ride to Boston. He had an uncle there. Samuel Holton, who had a boot and shoe store that was well-established. But even then, he, 
he could have come right out and asked his uncle for a job and the uncle would have provided it as indeed he did do. But Moody thought, no, I'm going to check in with Uncle Samuel, but then I'm going to beat the streets and, and see if I can come up with a job on my own. And after two or three days of wandering the streets with, you know, uh, a kind word, few and far between and, and no job prospects at all, he swallowed his pride and went back to see his uncle. And his uncle ended up being very wise early on. He said to him, look, you know, I will give you a job, but I want you to promise me you're going to go to church once a week at a church that I know has a good ministry and can help you get grounded and established here. You know, I owe that to your mother. It was through that church, through the friendships he made there, that D.L. Moody became a Christian in the back of that shoe store. This is the launching off point, the place where our story really kicks into gear. There is a brass plaque set in the side of the building that is there now, a modern building, commemorating that as the spot where Moody came to faith. If you live in Boston, go grab a photo of it. It's on Court Street. The spot where the store used to be is apparently now a Staples. With his newfound faith, Moody was on fire. I think a lot of times today, we think people have to have a little bit of seasoning, a little bit of training, get a little bit of biblical literacy under their feet and understand you know, what it's like to be a Christian and to walk the Christian life a while before we begin to get our feet wet in opportunities for service. And there's wisdom to that, to be sure. But I think Moody's instinct was really born of a deep sense of gratitude for what God had done for him. After all of his success on the East Coast, Moody moved to Chicago to pursue his fortune. At this time in his life, in his late teens, he was very focused on making money. He moved to Chicago to up his game as a salesman. And Moody was so trusted. He went on these traveling tours to purchase stock and bring it back to the store to represent wares at trade shows. And when Mr. Henderson, I believe it was, passed, his widow was so impressed with Moody's business acumen, his integrity, his honesty, that she entrusted him with running the family books for the business. He was not well educated, but he was gifted with business acumen, which, you know, is great, but comes with its own traps. Later in his life, he would blame poverty on laziness and see wealth as God's blessing on individuals. A common idea we still find today, but a bit reductive when squared with history, economics, and even the Bible. Especially in the 1800s, in an era when social upheavals, bank collapses, and panics often left hundreds of thousands of people out of work. Laziness doesn't even begin to explain the poverty of that era. Yet in 1876, Moody said, I do not believe we would have had these hard times if it had not been for sin and iniquity. Look at the money that is drank up, the money that is spent for tobacco. That is ruining men, ruining their constitutions. God has blessed this nation, yet men complain of hard times. But it's important to understand how he got there. He worked his backside off and succeeded, to his credit. But not everyone who works hard comes out on top. Not everyone who is lower class is lazy, especially when there are literally no jobs to be had. Not everyone has an uncle with a shoe business to fall back on. It's worth noting that. Okay, end of aside. It was at church that Moody met his wife. She and Moody were drawn together when they began to do work with the Sunday school uh, work that Moody started there. And it's kind of funny because Moody was wanting to do something with Sunday school. He could see that there were young people on the streets and there seemed to be no spark of hope in their lives. They certainly were needy. They were, they were ragged children. There was a slum that Moody knew of called Little Hell, and that indicates how dire it was. There were you know, sweatshops and prostitution, all kinds of things that are sadly with us today. Even though they wouldn't let him have a Sunday school in a formal way, they told him if he could get a class together, if he could gather a group of young people, he could bring them to church. So he wasn't allowed to teach, but he was allowed to buy pews in the church. And he bought four pews. He rented four pews in their church and he filled them with young people. And so he needed help. And very often he couldn't do it alone. He needed helpers. And so you would think that this demure young lady, Emma Ravel, that sort of caught Moody's eye, wouldn't be someone initially to want to sign up for that kind of work. But she did. Moody was great at attracting kids to himself. 
maybe because he knew what it was like to be a poor child. Moody would provide wood for their stoves and food for their homes, clothing for the children. And these broken families would begin to find a, a better way through the gospel being shared, yes, but also the love of God being shared in a, in a philanthropic, charitable sort of way. He'd ride a pony up the streets of Chicago and hand out candy, and they'd follow this guy who was giving out food. And he could give a little talk to these young people. And they were just as rough around the edges as he was. And I think he overcame his initial shyness and reluctance by saying to himself, you know, they're not that different than I was. I can speak to people like this. I can get my feet wet. He gained practice in sharing the gospel, starting with kids and then asking others for advice about talking to other age groups. This is going to blow your mind, but in 1860, 1,500 students attended Moody's Bible study. Then came the American Civil War. Moody did not enlist for the North, though he was an abolitionist. He didn't think he could kill another person. So he and his friends helped to set up a YMCA chapel at the military camp south of Chicago. He preached not just to Northerners, but also to Southern POWs as well. Nine times he went to the front lines, serving, preaching, and meeting with the wounded. Pretty soon, he was the president of the YMCA in his area. A lot of work for a man who's still working a full-time job. By 1860, with commission, he was earning the equivalent of $200,000 a year in today's money. But you can imagine, it was hard for him to juggle all of his responsibilities. It came down to a choice. Slow down his business endeavors, the real estate, the salesmanship, or back off the ministry. So he gave up business. This was, according to Moody, the hardest thing he ever did. The change happened because of a Sunday school class of young women. They were hostile, not taking their studies or their teacher seriously. The teacher was a friend of Moody's, but he was very ill and about to move away, carrying the regret of not reaching any of his students. I've never led any of my class to Christ. I really believe I've done the girls more harm than good. It's enough to break your heart. But Moody wasn't going to let the matter end there, with his friend getting on a train to go home feeling defeated. Instead, he had an idea. They would visit each of the girls at home and tell them personally about Jesus, much like Kimball had done at the shoe store. Together, the men set off, visiting each young woman. Hello. Moody's friend then explained salvation to the girls, and one by one, they came to the Lord. Afterwards, Moody said, Then God opened my eyes. That's when Moody realized it was either business or ministry. He grew up poor, he worked tirelessly to help his gigantic family, and he gave it up because he saw that he really belonged there, doing ministry. And it wasn't all roses. There was the Chicago fire that burned down much of what he and others had worked to build. But there is no denying the impact that this man and his team had on the lives of scores of young people. Now, how did this Sunday school teacher go from preaching to kids to one of the most famous men of his day? And how did he turn the maiden voyage of the Ferris wheel into an opportunity of a lifetime? We'll continue the story after these messages. This episode is brought to you by No Small Endeavor, the acclaimed podcast from Great Feeling Studios and PRX. In each episode, host and award-winning theologian Lee C. Camp sits down with courageous and impassioned people like Hollywood legend Rob Reiner and civil rights hero Reverend James Lawson, talking about what it means to find true happiness and flourish in day-to-day life. And if you're looking for somewhere to start, why not check out the recent episode with award-winning journalist and best-selling author Tim Alberta on Christian nationalism's role in the Republican Party. Follow No Small Endeavor on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Before the break, we talked about D.L. Moody's conversion, his business acumen, and his amazing ability to reach out to Sunday school children. Those of us familiar with his story generally remember Moody for his work with adults. That really exploded not in Chicago or even in the United States, 
but in Britain. For a start, he knew who C.H. Spurgeon was. And Moody was a big fan. Spurgeon being one of Europe's most influential preachers of the day. And today, really, he's still widely read in some Christian circles. Moody loved this guy. He had been published very widely in America. So Moody said that, you know, those books were kind of his university. You know, he read them from cover to cover, sometimes with help. Sometimes it took him a while to get through them, to be sure. But then there were other people, too, like George Mueller and his work with the orphanages there in the UK. Moody had read about that as well. As a, a Sunday school teacher, by that point, his Sunday school was often as large as a thousand young people. I mean, you have Abraham Lincoln, no less, in 1860, when he's traveling out Washington Way to begin to uh, prepare for his inauguration in early 1861. But in the fall of the previous year, 1860, he visited Moody Sunday School. I mean, it was that big of a thing. It had it begun to win that kind of attention. So Moody had a certain celebrity when he took ship to go abroad uh, and visit Emma's relatives. She was British and had uh, cousins and, and close relations over there. So it was partly a family thing. But it gave Moody the chance to sit at the feet of people he long read about and admired. It was on this trip that Moody began to find his voice and his audience among adults by preaching in his own folksy American style. Moody won over those English audiences early on because he was just delightfully unconventional. Every once in a while, as he would sort of ruefully admit, you know, he might put his foot in it. But by and large, they saw that he was genuine. And they were very intrigued because the needs there in London as one of the great metropolitan centers and the needs in, in Chicago really weren't all that different. And so there was a wonderful Anglo-American reforming impulse, as the, the scholars call it, that was shaped by a lot of people of faith in the inner city saying, you know, what are our opportunities? People working in poor areas of London and the United States shared information back and forth. What works? What doesn't work? Then they'd take that information back to their hometowns. This was an era of social excitement, when improving society through faith was all the rage with everyone from conservative to liberal denominations. It was while in Britain that Moody met Harry Morehouse, someone who was going to have a big impact on his preaching style, though he didn't know it at the time. And Moody was decidedly unimpressed with this young Irishman that he met who wanted very much to come to Chicago and talk. And you get the sense from Moody's descriptions of their early meeting that they, he was just sort of following Moody around. Morehouse was a former pickpocket turned Christian. And Moody is reported to have said, Well, if you should ever be in Chicago, come down to my place and I will give you a chance to preach. Thinking, of course, that that would be the end of it. Nope. Morehouse showed up in Chicago just when Moody was about to embark on a trip. Moody said, look, give him a chance to speak at one of the evening meetings. If he's if he's not any good, then, you know, find a polite way to just, you know, have him take a seat in the congregation. But uh, you guys go ahead and take care of it. I, I need to go out on this trip and let me know how he gets out. This kid wouldn't leave him alone. So he kindly put Morehouse in the care of his staff and left on his trip. It turns out that this young man was an incredibly gifted speaker who knew the Bible backwards and forwards and who talked with a deep uh, pathos and a very moving pulpit presence about the love of God. Which may not seem like a big deal, but that's not really the tone that was struck in those days. And it made a big impression. And this was in contradistinction to a lot of the fire and brimstone fare that so often is associated with the Victorian era. Morehouse's sermons, he spent a week, I think it was, talking about John 3.16. And people were flocking to hear him speak. And Moody was dumbfounded. He, he realized and he admitted, he said he was sorry. He completely misjudged this young man. That kind of thing really changed the character of Moody's ministry. Morehouse's preaching encouraged Moody to become a stronger student of the Bible. He collected stories, how scripture impacted normal people, and embarked on a lifelong habit of regular Bible study. Moody returned from Britain a full-blown celebrity, attracting thousands of people who wanted to hear him preach. But Moody wasn't contented to just attract crowds. He also wanted to go where the people were. 
So when the World's Fair headed for his city of Chicago in 1893, Moody rallied the troops. The world was headed for Chicago. So Moody seized the opportunity to take the gospel to the fair. Though it wasn't easy. Churches were wanting to boycott Moody's efforts to hold gospel gatherings there. One of the big movements in evangelicalism was advocating for the Sabbath day. Some evangelicals, though not all, were upset that the fair was going to be open on Sundays. So their desire was to protest by withdrawing from the event. But here was a case where people were coming from all over the world. So it was a reverse of what we think of with missions. We think about following Christ's commission and going to all the world, you know, preaching the gospel in different languages and cultural settings. Here are all these people who spoke a multitude of languages and from different cultures were coming from all over the world to Chicago. Moody didn't have to go anywhere. He was right there. Why turn your back on the world when it's in your backyard? Moody teamed up with various organizations and rented large venues across the city and held gospel meetings. One circus tent meeting held 15,000 people on the grounds of the fair itself. They didn't do it out of a sense of pride, but I think they just realized it would be poor stewardship, to say the least, if we didn't try and take advantage of this very unique opportunity to commend the gospel. And so you have Moody speaking. But also folks like A.J. Gordon, who went on to found Gordon College, a future fundamentalist who was in Moody's orbit. This team went on to preach to untold numbers of people from all over the world throughout the fair, despite some of the early objections. It's one of the things that is so admirable about the ministry of Moody. He didn't hesitate to do the right thing even when there was pushback. On top of his success in Britain and with the World's Columbian Exposition, Moody also set his sights on education. He returned to the location he was very fond of, his hometown of Northfield, Massachusetts. It was all farmland. The campus eventually there in Northfield, which was contiguous to Moody's home and his birthplace, was about 200 acres, maybe a little better than that, maybe 225 acres, but a lot of it was open farmland. They built a seminary, and classes began in 1879. Then came the Mount Hermon School in 1881 and the Northfield Bible Training School in 1890 teaching boys, girls, and seminarians right there in his hometown. And that's not all. Northfield became a focal point for Christian conferences that attracted college-age students, something that is going to play into our next episode. The ministry initially began with young people very much in focus and their families. There were games and events. College students from schools like Yale brought their banners and competed in sporting competitions, took part in meals, and had times of prayer and devotion. Yes, they had gospel gatherings. Yes, there was wonderful music by not only Ira Sankey, but Fanny Crosby, that wonderful hymn writer who wrote so many classic hymns. Blessed Assurance is is one of the ones that comes to mind. So there was a flowering of music, and, and the finest speakers in the country would come, and not just Moody himself, but he was always very happy to, to let someone else have the platform and sit in the front row and take notes when uh, friends like F.B. Meyer would speak. People who were very well educated from the universities would come, who were people of Christian conviction and share. Many of us know Moody now for his legacy he left in Chicago. The Chicago Bible Institute was established for people who might be too old for college and never attend a formal university. It opened in 1889 and was later renamed the Moody Bible Institute. That plot of land in Chicago would go on to house a publishing house. In those days, trashy dime store novels were available all over the city for cheap. Moody wanted to offer the people better fare including works by his beloved Charles Spurgeon at just 15 cents a copy, offering an alternative to the romance and crime page turners of his day. Chicago was also the home of what would become Moody Radio, a network of stations across the country. The name Moody has been associated with spreading the gospel far and wide to people of all shapes, sizes, and backgrounds. He traveled the world, and his publications and future radio ministry went further than he could ever imagine. But he also set a pattern for future fundamentalists. Mailing lists, a private publication house, Christian colleges, 
these would become the tools for the fundamentalist movement that wouldn't really begin until another 20 years after his death. Now, he didn't invent that model, but he honed it, and future fundamentalists copied it. We don't have time to cover all of his campaigns, how he crossed the oceans, held rallies like everywhere in the United States. It was a lot. A lot, lot. And Moody preached until just before his death. His final message in Kansas City is said to have reached 15,000 people. Let any man get an invitation from President McKinley to go down to the White House to some banquet. There is not a man here but would consider it a great honor to receive such an invitation. But only think of the invitation that I bring tonight. It comes from the King of Kings. It was a simple message anyone could understand. Also, it's interesting that he mentioned McKinley. Do you know who ran against McKinley for president? William Jennings Bryan. Now, Moody didn't vote for Bryan. But he admired his ability, and both of them at this time were popular speakers attending Bible conferences. Moody's last sermon came between Brian's first and second attempts for the presidency. Feeling ill, Moody did not finish his campaign. Moody died December 22, 1899. He was 62 years old. In the next episode, I'll talk about the many streams that fed out of Moody's life and how they impacted the fundamentalist movement. After talking with Kevin Belmonte, though, I was convinced that this episode had to focus on the good stuff, the character and tenacity that led D.L. Moody to battlefields, a world's fair, and the other side of the ocean to spread the good news about his savior. His life led to the education of countless numbers of students, many from poor families. His ministry gave hope to untold millions, and he gave much of the proceeds to build new ministries or help more people. In an age when celebrity preachers show off their fancy shoes and cars, Moody feels to me like a breath of fresh air. I also want to go back to that shoe store in Boston, the young man pacing the streets outside, wondering if he had the courage to go in and share the gospel with a shoe clerk in the back. In our bitter and hurt age, it's easy to overlook the everyday courage and conviction it takes to tell someone about the gospel. Sometimes we're even tempted to mock the notion of telling someone that Jesus died for them. But think about what sprouted from that man's faithfulness. By telling a shoe salesman about Jesus, Huge chunks of the English-speaking world experienced a burst of cross-denominational revival, all due to an act of the Holy Spirit and some guy walking through a door and expressing what was on his heart. We don't often cover the necessity of evangelism on this show. We get pretty crusty about this stuff in some circles, seeing evangelism as necessarily pushy or insulting. But God uses human people to achieve heavenly outcomes. It is a simple fact of our faith. So, if you'll allow, I'd like us all to take a deep breath. Is your jaw clenched at a call for evangelism? Are you picturing some negative examples you've seen in the past? Let's push those aside for just a moment. Think of a young Mr. Kimball out on the sidewalk, looking into that store. What would you do in his place? Is there someone in your life you should pray for or take a bold step for? You just never know the outcome of one shoe salesman on fire for his God. Special thanks to Kevin Belmonte. His book is D.L. Moody, A Life published by Moody Publishers. Thanks to Janice Todd there, who connected me with our guest today. Thanks also to the patrons of this show. By giving a little each month, you help me tell these big sweeping stories. And you'll gain access to a special bonus I made with Kevin Belmonte, who tells me about some of the other things he likes to talk about. I won't give it away. Sign up to help at patreon.com slash truthspodcast. Truce is listener-supported. Right now, only about 2-3% to 3% of listeners give 
anything to help this project continue. To give you an idea of how this show is made, I read Kevin's book In Between Shifts at Work. I proofread this script while waiting for the wrestling team to finish practice, and while sitting in a cold school bus in Riverton, Wyoming. And I recorded this episode between shifts as a school bus driver. Imagine what I could do if I were better rested, or if I could focus on the project. It would be so great. Visit trucepodcast.com slash donate for more information. Thanks also to everyone who gave their voices to this episode. Eric Nevins of the Halfway There podcast, Jerry Dugan from the Beyond the Rut podcast, Carl Klemmer, and Michelle and Shay Watson of the Lipstick and Pencils podcast. God willing, we'll continue this story in two weeks. Subscribe to the show so you get every new episode as it's released. Truce is a production of Truce Media, LLC. I'm Chris Starin, and this is Truce. This episode is brought to you by The Compelled Podcast. What would you do if you came face-to-face with a murderer sent to kill you for being a Christian? For Virginia Prodan, that question isn't hypothetical. Virginia was a small, petite attorney defending Christians in court in communist Romania. And she was really good. So good, in fact, she caught the attention of the communist regime. One day, a tall, muscular man walked into her office, closed the door, and pulled out a gun. He barked, Shut up. Sit down. I'm here to kill you. Virginia was face to face with a trained assassin. What happened next would surprise both of them. Listen to Virginia's entire story on the Compelled Podcast, where they find incredible true life stories of God working through the lives of normal people. Virginia is on episode number 31, which is titled, He Came to Kill Me. Listen on your podcasting app or at compelledpodcast.com.